Shopping for humans is hard this holiday season. Shopping for your dog is easy thanks to Bark. Every month we deliver toys and treats just for your dog. Whether it's fun plush or tough toys for heavy chewers, we spoil all the dogs. Subscribe now and get a free upgrade at BarkBox.com slash iHeart. Seeing is believing. And you're not going to believe how bright and vivid the colors are on the Samsung Neo QLED and OLED TVs powered by the neural quantum processor. Because this is an audio ad. Unless you can see it, which means you already have one. Nice. Samsung, more wow than ever. I'm Jay Shetty, and on my podcast, On Purpose, I've had the honor to sit down with some of the most incredible hearts and minds on the planet. Oprah, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Hart. You get to hear the raw, real-life stories behind their journeys and the people that made a difference in their lives so that they can make a difference in ours. Visit dreamcloudsleep.com today to get 40% off any mattress. Plus, use promo code J for an additional $50 off. That's promo code J for an additional $50 off on top of 40% off every mattress purchase. Hi everyone, it's Amanda Rieger Green. Welcome to Soul Sessions. Thank you for joining me. Today we have a special episode. It's part two of wellness discussion with my client and friend Sarah Peterson. To give you a little bit of a recap, she has been in the events industry for 15 years. She currently works in business operations for Amazon Web Services. In addition to that, she is on Amazon's Mental Health and Wellbeing Affinity Group, as well as their Emotional Intelligence and Services Committee. Her contribution to workplace wellness and well-being is not only a passion, but a lifestyle that she has created. And she's been able to affect tremendous personal success in that and also professional success. And that is the focus of our discussion today. So if you didn't get to listen to part one, I encourage you to go back because Sarah shares about her own wellness journey, her call to action, and how she started to apply practical tools and resources into her lifestyle. And today what we're going to talk about is how that has affected her professionally, finding deeper meaning, passion, and success, and of course, happiness in work. So I know you will relate to this. Welcome back, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for intimately sharing your journey and the many tools and resources and insights that you have discovered over the past few years and how they have positively influenced change, effective change in your life, contributing to your happiness and success. I think it's very relatable. And this topic about wellness. When we work on our own wellness, it starts to filter out into all parts of our life. And the question that many people have on their hearts is, how do I find professional well-being and success? Where is my passion? How am I using my talents effectively? How am I contributing? And how do I feel that cohesion in the workplace, in my professional life? And I think you can speak to that not only personally, but how you've been able to to, in your work at Amazon, become a part of the wellness movement and initiatives within Amazon. So talk to me a little bit about your personal wellness journey. One of the things that you and I were discussing was waking up in the morning and feeling a sense of dread <laughs> when when we had an anxiety, like, oh my gosh, I've got all this on my plate today. This is what I have. Feeling this doom, this dread, and how that was something that became you became very aware of and began to shift and heal personally, but how it started to transform workplace fitness and well-being for you. Like you said, I've been working in corporate America for 15 plus years now, and I've had periods of time where I felt very energized by the work that I was doing and times that I didn't. And when it comes to workplace well-being, the biggest lesson that I have learned is that you have to take your own well-being into your own hands. Yes, empl- your employer can do have employee resource groups and pro- provide benefits, and they are responsible for creating sort of the culture of the company. And yes, that goes into your wellness when it comes to working. However, you also have to take some responsibility for it. And I think when it comes to your career, 
for me, I went through a hard time over COVID, which we talked about in the first episode, but I was feeling exactly how you were describing. Like I was thankful that I had a job. However, like I would dread going to bed at night because that meant I had to wake up in the morning and I had like just the stress of it all um, when it came to work was really overwhelming to me. And it was just the, the work never ends. And it was problems with relationships at work and just have feeling like I had too much on my plate all the time. And it just felt like a hamster spinning on a wheel and just feeling that anxiety, that dread every day was a really unhealthy place for me. And so that really ignited a passion in me to figure out, okay, why am I feeling this way? This is not a way to live. I don't want to be spending five days a week <laughs> dreading what I'm doing. And yes, like you can't always control getting a new job. Like looking for a new job is a full-time position, especially over COVID. And for me, I have an events background that, that can be challenging finding a new job in and of itself. I really just was in a place where I was dreading work. And so I kind of figured out like, how can I feel better throughout the day and not spend, like I said, five days a week feeling this looming doom, knowing that I can't just quit my job today because I need to be able to pay my bills. And I was not in a financial position to quit. I, although I could have for a little bit, and I'm sure I would have figured it out, but just, I was way too scared to to just up and quit a career, even though I knew it wasn't really speaking to my passions. I wasn't, it wasn't energizing me, but I also yeah. was not in a position to quit, just practically speaking. Well, I think a lot of people relate to that because you're being realistic. You're getting very honest. This goes back to self-awareness and honesty. Mm -hmm. Those two massive components we talked about in part one of personal wellness and lifestyle change is this ability to get honest. Oh my gosh, five days out of the week, I am going to bed anxious, waking up in dread. Five day, If we put that into perspective, depending on our work schedule, five days out of a seven day week, if you do the percentage on that, that's a pretty hefty percentage of your life that you're spending in dread and anxiety. So naturally, your your creativity, your passion, your talents are not harnessed in your workplace. So you're not only feeling or doing a disservice to yourself or your employer. And it's and and of course, as we discussed in the first one, you are a recovering overachiever, perfectionist like I am, like many of us out there. So it creates this chain reaction of emotional despondency where I feel guilty. I, I'm an imposter. I'm not putting my heart and soul into this. I'm doing this because I have to, and I have to pay my bills. And what else am I going to do otherwise? And then it just creates this residue and energy that is not productive. But at the same time, when we can figure that out and say, okay, how do I start to affect change? Yeah. You talked about in our first podcast about some of the things that you did to create personal change. So so if you haven't listened to that out there, everybody, I would go and listen to it because Sarah talks a lot about getting quiet, spending time with yourself, even when it's uncomfortable, self-awareness, looking at limiting beliefs, patterns of behavior that may not be authentic or true to ourselves today. There's a lot of nuggets of wisdom that contributed to her workplace health and wellness that will be helpful. But when you started to feel better internally, get more clear with yourself, what did you notice was out of alignment professionally for you? And how did you start affecting healthy, practical change? So when it came to my workplace and my workplace well-being, I think one of the things that I was doing incorrectly or a mistake that I was making was putting way too much stock into my career, like putting all of my eggs in one basket. And because I'm not totally fulfilled with this job, I allowed myself to kind of spiral and get so upset about things instead of looking towards, you know, gratitude and being thankful that I had a job and, you know, kind of reframe, reframing things, which we talked a lot about in the last episode. So for me, really, I recognized that, okay, I'm giving way too much of my power away right now in allowing myself to live in negativity and dread and doom uh, over a job, which just seemed like 
way too extreme for me. Like there's life is way too amazing for this. Like I don't want to dread my life and it's not all about work. And so a big thing for me when it came to assessing my relationship with my work was one understanding that I was unhappy in my current job and really understanding why. And for me, it was because I was in a position that wasn't a great match for my skill set. Or, you know, I'm not going to put it all on my employer. Like I just wasn't achieving in that role. And I had been in the same industry for a long time and I was just feeling like a crossroads for me and I was ready for a change. But just taking the time to understand what the issue was, was helpful for me as kind of a first step and not giving my power away and learning to be grateful for the discomfort. Because I think that there's, when you are feeling out of alignment, or if you're in a job where you're like, oh gosh, this just isn't it. For me, I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. So it's been kind of a thing of trial and error and figuring out what you like and what you don't like. And when you're in a job where you feel like totally stuck, you have to kind of figure out what is it about this job that is bringing you down? Is it the environment? Is it the people? Is it the culture? Is it the work itself? Like there's so much that goes into your workplace and like your workplace well-being. So it's important to understand and be self-aware about, okay, if I'm feeling out of alignment, I'm really unhappy, I'm feeling this dread, why is that? And then like really pinpointing and addressing what that is. I think that's so simple and clear. And for anyone out there, if you are struggling professionally in feeling aligned, feeling right-sized, healthy, whole, like you're using your talents and you're passionate and contributing, whatever gets you firing and wiring, knowing that and where it's it's underperforming, underutilized. But like you said, identifying what components are depleting you from your your creativity and your your talents and passions. So is it my teammates? Is it the team that I'm working on? Is it the department I'm in? Is it the balance of being in and out of the office, completely working virtually or being in the office all the time and feeling micromanaged? There are so many things that when we start to assess the facts, which is again where I think you're you're so equipped is you get curious, you look at the facts. And I think for anybody out there, start by getting honest and looking at the facts. Why am I unhappy? What is it about this job that is not resonating with me? It is, you know, creating the dread. And then to speak to the other part of things back into what you were saying around like the five days a week, going to bed anxious, waking up in dread and looking at that big chunk of your life not being spent in the present moment because dread and anxiety are definitely tripping into the future. I know for me, let's say I have an abundant week and everybody knows me, I always replace the word busy with abundant. I can easily sit, you know, in the evening and think, oh my gosh, I have all this on my plate. Oh my gosh, how am I going to get all this done? I mean, that is the first go-to for my brain, my hard wiring. I am very conscious of that. And when I do that, I laugh and I say, excuse me, Amanda, I just have a die. I, I disassociate, which you and I were talking about, the detaching, disassociating. I stop for a minute and in a healthy way, I say, excuse me, you're sitting right here this evening. You've got both of your dogs with you. You have the remainder of the evening to wind down. You just had a good dinner. You know, I start to look at where I am right now and why in my comfort of the evening, I'm needing to feel guilty, dread, anxiety about tomorrow morning, which might be 10 to 12 hours away, whatever that time frame is, and say, okay, let me let me get really present right now because tomorrow will come. And also, I know this personally, nighttime is a very important time for what our brains, our bodies, our consciousness resonates in. So if I go to bed in anxiety, dread, fear, worry, any of those emotions and thoughts that really contribute to the quality of my well-being, if I marinate in that over six, eight hours in the evening, plus the two hours I'm spending watching TV, but also feeling anxious and dread, 
I am exacerbating that energy into my next day and basically calling it forth, basically manifesting it. So for me, I know personally, I am so hyper aware of that and I consciously take action. And sometimes I'll just say it. I'll say it to my husband, just so you know, I'm feeling anxiety and dread about tomorrow or whatever I'm feeling. And he will say something very clear to me. Well, why are you feeling that? That we're not at tomorrow yet. We're today. Like, and we're about to watch X, Y, Z show on TV or, or we're going to have dinner with some friends right now. I mean, I can be already in anxiety when we have dinner plans and I haven't even gotten to my wind down. So being really conscious of those things, does that, I know that that helps for me, but if I can stop the cycle or halt it or become very aware of it, then I have a chance. I have a chance to actually affect my day the next day. Yeah. Absolutely. And that made me think of, so I wa- I don't know if you saw The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles, like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash motivate or text motivate to 500 500. That's audible.com slash motivate or text motivate to 500 500 to try Audible free for 30 days. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles and Toyota has them. With more on the way, but we also know a BEV is not for everyone. Whether it's because of cost, range, or concerns about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon neutral future. In vehicles and manufacturing plants too, in the years ahead. The Materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is Electrified Diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop. Learn more and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Jim Gaffigan here with some more Straight Talk. Now you can get a Walmart Plus membership, plus not pay for it, because it's included with Straight Talk wireless plans. You get free delivery with Walmart Plus, plus a Paramount Plus subscription included. Plus, you pay less for gas. That's a lot of pluses. Only Straight Talk gives you unlimited 5G data and Walmart Plus included on select plans for free. Straight Talk wireless, available at Walmart. Requires service on gold or platinum unlimited. One offer per eligible account. Paramount Plus essential plan only. Separate registration required. Additional terms apply. I don't know if you saw The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. It's like the best thing I've ever watched in my life. It's incredible. Yes, yes. It was a docu all about Michael Jordan and his coming up. Yeah. He said something. I was taking notes that whole documentary. I'm like, okay, how do I be more like Michael Jordan? I know he is. He is pretty much a badass. Like (laughs) there, you know, I mean, he really, his discipline and his work ethic and honing his craft, he was very dedicated to that. So yes. Okay. Keep, keep talking about that. I think it's a great example. I'm six weeks away from getting my master's in positive psychology. And the whole thing on that is the study of thriving, like studying my, because a lot of mental health, wellness, it's all, you know, you hear a lot about anxiety, depression, but they like, that's mental illness. That's not mental yeah. wellness. So when things are going well, what does that look like? How do you thrive? And he said in that, that documentary that they, he got asked a question about, you know, the big game before the finals, would you worry and stress out? And how did you calm your nerves and get into a good headspace? And he was so calm and cool about it. And he was like, why am I going to stress out about a shot I haven't taken yet? And I was like, damn, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that's right. But it is in you like why spending your time 
worrying about things is such a waste of time. Like some amount of worry is good. I mean, if you go down the wrong side of the street and you feel unsafe, yes. like that kind of worry to protect you is good. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. Cause that's an, in, an intuitive hit that says, Ooh, danger. Something isn't safe. Yeah. But when we use worry as a tool and it becomes hardwired into our energy field and a, it's almost like a coping mechanism, an unhealthy one at that. I always find too, with people that I read for and in clients, worry, doubt, shame, those lower insidious vibrations are the cancer causers yeah. because they vibrate so low and so quietly that they become natural. And then they they adversely impact our actually our biological rhythms and functions, which of course impact our mental health and well-being. But I like the distinction you made between mental health, mental illness, and wellness. Yeah. Two different, you know, and, and I think that is imperative to define in workplace wellness, organizational health and well-being. We have the physical component, we have the mental component, but then we have these other components emotional health and consciousness, being able to rewire our brains, our patterns, become very self-actualized and self-aware. Harnessing those together can optimize not only people and in the right place and space, but the outcomes, the output for not only the organization, but for the human being, the contributor in, in that role. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like your thoughts actually can make you sick. Scientifically speaking, yes. you release hormones into your body and excessive negative thinking will make you sick and cause disease in your body. And so a big thing when it comes to workplace and like feeling out of alignment is just getting a hold of your mindset and just understanding that where you are today is not going to be your forever. This is not going to be your job forever. Asking yourself, what can you be grateful for is great. Reframing is a, is a really great thing that you can do. A, a very subtle verbiage shift that works for me. If I find myself saying, I have to like, oh, I have to put together this document. Amazon has this big writing culture. So it's like, oh, I have to put to, write this six page document. It's like, no, I get to. I get to yeah. go in front of the smartest people I've ever worked with and get critiqued by them. Like it's a very intense culture and it can feel very overwhelming, but just reframing as opportunities, uh, I think is, is really important and a powerful thing that, that you can do when it comes to, to work. And also compartmentalizing has really helped me. And I don't want to, I'm cautious about saying that because I don't want people to feel like they shouldn't feel their emotions or like taking the time and like give yourself time and space when you're feeling negative emotions, but don't live in it for too long. And just learning to detach yourself in a healthy way. That's what I did in my career where it's like, okay, I know I don't want to work here, but detaching yourself and saying, okay, I'm not going to let this affect the rest of my life and bleed into my other relationships. Like I found myself getting short with my partner and, you know, like, it's like, I don't want to do that. Like you don't let it bleed into your other relationships is kind of the takeaway. And the best way that I found to do that is being present. So when you're at work, be at work, do the best that you can, put your head down, ask for help, you know, don't drown at work alone. If you're really feeling overwhelmed, talk to someone. Of course, every workplace is going to be different, but something that I learned is being okay and raising your hand and saying, you know what, I have too much on my plate or even taking it a step further and depending on your relationship with your manager, but saying, you know what, this role isn't quite what I expected. Um, I, I don't feel like it's a great fit in these ways. For so long, I was afraid to do that because I thought it would put a target on my back and you don't want to be the weak link or you don't want to have your employer to lose trust in you. So I would tread with this a little lightly. It depends on your relationship, but I was fortunate. I had a, a manager who was pretty accepting and I was just said, you know, like, I don't feel like this is a great fit for me. And 
a week later, I had another job at that same company. I remember this for you. I mean, I remember it clearly because you exercised your ability to communicate that you were you were not comfortable. It wasn't a good fit. And because of the culture that you're in within Amazon, there are lots of internal opportunities and they've set up good checks and balances to be able to grow within the organization, explore other roles. And you were able to healthfully assert yourself with your manager. And what you alluded to is not all of us feel like we have relationships with our manager where we can say that or there will be blowback. But you did a lot of personal work and clarity and clarification in order to assert yourself. And I know in those kinds of moments, which are pivotal personally, professionally, when we deny our truth, when we stay unhappy for the sake of fear, what if what if there's retaliation? What if I'm fired? What, you know, we go to the doomsday scenario, which that's human, that's normal, that's back into that fight or flight part of our brain we discussed in in the first episode. But why not? What if I don't assert myself? What am I risking? Oh, my happiness, my well-being, me using my talents more optimally within the organization where I could be more useful, productive, and contributing to the overall of the organization and feel happier and feel better. And when you were in that discernment process, because I distinctly remember, it was all the, what if I don't? don't speak up. What if I don't do this, then I'm just going to stay unhappy, unhealthy, probably get sick, you know, become as a partner, you know, more irritable, more discontent, and it's going to come out sideways in all aspects of my life. So there is an element of courage that comes with our well-being and our wellness that we we do have to do hard things, yeah. courageous things, but when we are speaking our truth, you know, it may not perfectly align or the the path may not beautifully unfold exactly the way we envision it. But usually when we are speaking from our heart and our truth and coming from a place of neutrality, not retaliation or anger, I know for me, that's a big piece of it is, do I believe in this? Am I speaking from my truth? Am I cleaning up my side of the street? And I'm also doing it from a place of neutrality, not from resentment or anger or fear. I'm coming from honesty. I'm coming from clarity. I'm coming from a space where my motive is more pure, more aligned, more authentic, more in integrity. And if I am, then I'm going to leave the rest up for me to a higher power, to the universe, to the other people and players involved. And I'm going to trust that things are going to unfold for the highest good. I mean, those are the kinds of intentions that I said. I bring a, you know, a higher consciousness into that discussion because I can't do it alone and I do need to ask for help. So Thank you for that. Of course. Yeah. And I, another way that you can frame it too, if you don't feel comfortable saying this isn't a good fit for me, if you don't want to go that extreme with it or that honest, a way to kind of frame it in like a good corporate political way is I'm really great with people. I wish that, you know, are there opportunities for me to get work that is more aligned with X, Y, Z, like whatever you're, you're looking for, like, or is there more opportunities for, you know, creativity or coding or whatever it is that your strengths are, or whatever you're lacking in your current job, maybe you won't be able to get it in your current position, but you can make connections and you're usually your manager can help you with that. But with roles outside of your job, like I would say something that's really helped me when I have been in a full-time position where I maybe didn't feel so in alignment is picking up side projects that do fill my passion. So that's sort of where I started working with the mental health and well-being group at Amazon. Like I went through my dark time, pulled myself out of it, and it was very practical. Like I could put together a playbook for how I did it. And it's like, okay, I really am passionate about this and I want to teach these skills to others. And so I started doing work with them. I found executives who are doing this type of work and I'll just put time on their calendar. Like I'm very aggressive when it comes to going after what I want in, in the corporate world. And you kind of have to be like, that goes back to taking your well being into your own hands. You also have to take your career into your own hands. And, and what that looks like to me is making those connections, figuring out like whose career do I admire here, whether it's a working style or the actual work that they're doing, the type of work, 
where are those people yeah. in my organization? And people want to help people. They really do. Like you'd be surprised. I sent an email off to Jeff Bezos when I got to Amazon's because why not? You know, <laughs> why not? Exactly. And I did get a reply and I did end up the reason why this role that I'm taking now with the emotional intelligence and success community moving into 2024, I'm moving into a VP role where I'm going to be managing all of their internal emotional intelligence activity. And the way that I was able to do that is I put together a document that outlined what were the business challenges that were going to be solved by and what I wanted to do and what my plan was. And that got accepted. And now I'm going to be doing that moving into 2024. First of all, you all have to know out there, like I've known Sarah for a while now and her journey personally, professionally, spiritually, mentally, I mean, so many components on an intimate level. This is so huge. And for her to have her personal wellness journey evolve into a role where she can make a massive impact on a practical and a cultural level of a a huge organization and it to be brought into reality. These are big leaps and they came with a lot of practical, consistent action and dedication to your own wellness. And and this is an example to anyone out there. I love that you shared about being aggressive and she's not talking about confrontation or aggression in the lower vibration. She's saying, put yourself out there. It's essentially a numbers game too. There's networking and people do want to help people and you see what sticks, you know, you put it out there. And when we get rejected, I want to talk about rejection in that sense too, because back to the numbers game and reaching out and connecting and networking, that takes effort. And I can't tell you how many people I connect with and I'm like, listen, you got to network. Like, I know it doesn't feel good. I know you're kind of stuck in your energy field right now, but start reaching out and start, here are some simple ways and don't worry so much about who responds. You know, don't, don't get focused on the outcome of the connection. Just start to connect because you will create that momentum and that energy that is setting a precedence in your energy field that will build a momentum. And then what is aligned will start to stick and it will stick in a bigger timeline, a more divine timeline within the field, within the universe, maybe not your personal timeline. So when you find yourself discouraged or feeling rejected, see where you can really redefine that or heal that because you're building a resiliency and you have done all of those things. And now Look what you have coming up in 2024. I am thrilled for you. Plus, it's needed and it's setting a new precedent, essentially, a new place in workplaces and in Amazon for the importance of emotional intelligence and that being a functional role within the organization. That's huge. And that's a big success. Congratulations. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I just see a big need uh, having worked in corporate America for so long. It doesn't have to be at the expense of your well-being. Like you can achieve. Right. And actually, if you look at the research and the numbers, the more that you take care of yourself and take breaks and recharge, that actually increases your productivity. So I've learned like self-care and also like you, we're talking about networking and I know that can be a little bit barfy, like, oh God, I don't yeah. network. Like that sounds corporate and awful. It's all about framing and like reframing. I view it as more making connections versus networking. And that's a big thing too, when it comes to workplace well-being, is having connections and making connections They've done a lot of studies around this. And there was some study out there that was saying, if you have two friends at work, it's the equivalent of making an extra $100,000 a year, which I don't know where that came from. Or that was uh, my colleague, Rich Wall, who started the EQ community at Amazon, uh, had shared that with me. But it's, it, it's true. Like if you are upset at work or unhappy at work, like having that one person who you really trust, who you you can talk to and vent to a little bit. I, I'm careful about venting. Like you don't want to spend too much of your time like focusing on things that you don't like, but just being able to have that person or people is really important, but you have to be careful in corporate America. You don't want to like say too much and like you always need to yeah. be political and all that, but just having 
connections at work, personal connections, and like taking that time to actually yes. get to know. Cultivating relationships. Yeah. yeah. And so while networking may be a word that like, ugh, we don't even want to think about that. It's about cultivating relationships, interpersonal connections. Mm-hmm. And I love the whatever the study was, is saying having two friends at work is like an extra hundred grand. It's really this element of the equity we build in community, in connection. We work in community. We are hardwired for community and we do live in a society that is beginning to isolate and pull back from connection and community. And we we thrive on that. We need it. I know that my creativity is harnessed with other people and alongside other people. And when I see someone else firing and wiring, I fire and wire higher. There is a natural resonance and energy flow that is exponentially greater. And that's essentially what you're encouraging is reaching out, making connections. Somebody who astounds you or says something amazing in a meeting or that you was totally on point with the way that you were conceptualizing something, reaching out to them and saying, hey, you shared this in a meeting. Thank you. I totally resonated or I've been thinking about this the last couple of weeks. Maybe we can connect sometime or I'd love to visit with you further about fill in the blank. Yeah. It's getting it's that courage that you were talking about, that assertion, asserting ourselves and also reaching out to like minded or resources within people that build our network, that create these connections that can open new doors for us, stimulate new ideas and foster greater health and well-being. Yep, absolutely. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash motivate or text motivate to 500, 500. That's audible.com slash motivate or text motivate to 500, 500 to try Audible free for 30 days. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. Yeah, we hear a lot about fully electric vehicles in Toyota. They got them with more on the way, I'm telling you. We also know a BEV is not for everyone. Whether it's because of cost, range, or if you're like Ray and you're going to start freaking out, oh no, I can't find a charging station when that battery gets real low. Yeah, plus the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter beyond zero. So Toyota's vision for a carbon neutral future in vehicles and in manufacturing plants too. In the years ahead, trust me, it's happening, baby. The materials used to make just one long range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug in hybrids or 90 gas electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified, diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, or get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Vroom, vroom. Jim Gaffigan here with some more Straight Talk. Now you can get a Walmart Plus membership, plus not pay for it, because it's included with Straight Talk wireless plans. You get free delivery with Walmart Plus, plus a Paramount Plus subscription included. Plus, you pay less for gas. That's a lot of pluses. Only Straight Talk gives you unlimited 5G data and Walmart Plus included on select plans for free. Straight Talk Wireless, available at Walmart. Requires service on gold or platinum unlimited. One offer per eligible account. Paramount Plus essential plan only. Separate registration required. Additional terms apply. What are some of the initiatives internally that you think have been most successful within Amazon's uh, mental health 
and well-being affinity group and looking at emotional intelligence that have been resonating with employees? That What are some of the biggest asks? What's been resonating yeah. and where is a lot of the focus right now? A program that I have been managing this year, it was called an e, we call it the EQ in Action program, but every month we pick one emotional intelligence theme. So if you're not familiar with emotional intelligence, it's essentially learning how to manage your own emotions and then the emotions of others. And this whole concept of EQ was a little bit crazy at Amazon at first, because it's like, why are you talking about emotions and mushy stuff in a corporate setting? What I have learned through working with them is that emotions really are data, like they're data points mm-hmm. that can be either used or ignored. And when it comes to being successful in your career, you have to be able to manage the people side of things as much as the business. So like Amazon, for instance, is a very innovative culture, IQ through the roof, you know, but where we saw what was needed most was really that people side and the human behind the work because it's people working with people at the end of the day. And so this EQ and action program that we have been running is every month we pick a theme that goes along with emotional intelligence. So the ones that resonated the most were self-care. So we did a whole month around Mm -hmm. self-care. And so this is, if you're struggling, like self-care needs to be non-negotiable. It just has to be for for everybody. Schedule it. This When I say self-care, diet, exercise, sleep. I mean, these are not not new concepts, but sleep is so important. Getting outside, scheduling time for things that bring you joy, nurturing the relationships in your life, making, t- you know, for me, I can get real into work and permit uh, really badly. <laughs> I've learned to foster my relationships outside of work and also my relationship with myself. So your relationship with yourself, that goes along with self-care, how you talk to yourself is really important. That's been a big focus. What I have learned is through working in this corporate setting, doing this emotional intelligence work is that the work side people really have down, but it's like, it's taking care of yourself and your relationship with yourself that people seem to struggle with. And I hear a lot about burnout and imposter syndrome. And this is from like the tippy top executives at Amazon down to the fulfillment workers, you know, like, no matter what level you're at in the organization, those seem to be the biggest pain points and just finding purpose in in work as well. So it's more kind of the existential questions that people struggle with most. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love that you are bringing this to the forefront and you have a voice within Amazon that does have a massive impact in the corporate world and in corporate wellness, because so many leaders that I talk to are experiencing these things, burnout, even imposter syndrome. The, the thing that we talked about in our first episode of everything on paper looks successful, but internally, I'm not happy or I don't feel successful or I'm not motivated, passionate, driven in places I used to be, whatever uh, whatever may be going on. And so many leaders, and I don't mean to say this as a blanket statement, aren't really sure about investing in EQ. IQ, sure. EQ, uh, why are we talking about feelings in the workplace and how we feel? When we're looking at wellness, we have maybe the physical components of wellness, physical health and well-being, the healthcare component of keeping people healthy, health insurance benefits, reducing cost uh, in, in that sense. And then we have mental health, which again, stigmas have been taken off of. And now it's taken a more prominent place in health care and wellness and well-being. But we have new frontiers and they are emotional intelligence. And then I would also take it a step further and talk about higher consciousness, consciousness, because you've alluded to it when you talk about meaning and purpose and that all tracks and resonates. So the employers to me who are more innovative in looking at new ways of revitalizing and optimizing their organizations and their workforce are looking at EQ and also meaning and purpose to respond to burnout or stressors and pressures that happen 
in everyday life. I love that you said that one way that you all have tackled this is having a monthly theme. I think for anybody out there that has influence in their workplace or even in life, if you want to have a monthly theme, I think this could apply personally or organizationally, having a theme. What am I going to focus on this month? So if that's you personally, make a theme. Okay, I want to focus on self-care this month, or I want to focus on my, you know, my physical health and what I'm putting into my body, food this month, eating healthy to feel healthier, to be healthier, having a monthly theme. But I love too that anyone out there who does have an impact professionally in their workspace and have a voice and can contribute or is a leader in your workplace, how can you introduce a theme and maybe get some people to collaborate or come in and speak or give a presentation, do a webinar? Because I know Amazon does this. But If you want to have a monthly theme, you know, in 2024, different themes that contribute to wellness, overall health and well-being, and then asking other people to come in, give presentations, share insights and resources to contribute, that can create a cohesion. So I love the idea of or the implementation of a monthly theme. Yeah, because it's hard to facilitate culture change. You know, like when I talk to the top leadership team at Amazon, it all sounds great on paper, but it's like, what business problems are these actually solving? Yes. And it's like, well, which is, which is their question. And they, they answer to their shareholders right. on that eventually. Yes. Yeah. And this is a company that is in place to make money. Like this is not yes. a therapist office or a sorority. No. And so it's like, I yeah. understand the, the, but what I have learned and found is through there and there's research and data to back this up is like when employees are happier, they're much more productive. When they're yeah. taking care of themselves, they're more creative. Like the output of the work is better if the person behind the work is being taken care of. There's data to support that. And and I'm about to say something pretty bold in a discussion that I just had with a CEO and someone who I know very well and has been very successful And we were talking about employee wellness, workplace wellness, and the overall fitness of the organization. And the conversation that came out of that was, well, you know, I am hiring someone for a job. I am hiring them to do X, Y, Z job, and I expect them to come in and do this job. Why do I really care if they're happy at home? Right. That was a straightforward question. Is it my responsibility for them to be happy at home. And on paper, no. But I know that when I'm happier personally, I'm a human being. I'm going to have difficult times in my life and I'm going to have, you know, smooth sailing times in life. There are times when I'm on cruise control and things are rocking along okay. And then I'm going to experience a family illness or something sick because that is the nature of life. So ultimately an employer is not hiring me to take care of my well-being and the personal challenges I face in life. However, how can CEOs, how can leaders, executive teams, managers respond to productivity, optimizing people performance, but how does that track back to their happiness and their ownership on personal wellness and well-being, which to me talks about resiliency and how how can employers embrace resiliency for their workforce so they can experience the productivity and navigate the downtimes in an economy or in people's personal lives. Yeah. I know that's a really big question I'm asking you, but that that was an actual conversation I had. And and I, I mean, my heart sank, Yeah, you know, like when I had that conversation and I understood where it was coming from. I understood both sides of the coin, but also that's, that is that leader's bottom line is I'm not responsible for your happiness at home. Yeah. And I don't disagree with that. <laughs> I think that yeah. It is completely fair. I think my answer to that when it comes to teaching these skills is to keep it focused on the work. When you're teaching it at work, like for instance, self-management was a theme, one of our themes. So how do you manage your own emotions? Like when you get triggered at work and in a meeting and so you don't bite back yes. at somebody. And so we teach those real tactical, practical skills to help you be successful in the workplace. And we put put it in like through a work lens 
However, yeah. the skills are the same at home or yes. at work. Okay. So it's like, we'll teach you these skills and this is going to help you in your work, but maybe you won't, you know, be short with your kids tonight because you have learned yes. box breathing or like methods of like to, to bring yourself down when you're feeling triggered. So I agree that it's not a employer's responsibility. Yes. But I also think that the people side of it is part of the business. And if you want to have a creative, innovative yeah. culture where there's psychological safety, where people feel free to be authentically themselves and come with their ideas and bring their diverse perspectives, you have to arm them with these Skill. Well, you don't have to, but you're going to be ahead if you arm your people. There you go. Skills. Yes, you don't have to, but you're going to be ahead if you do. And this is, and to me, I agree that it is not the employer's responsibility to create my happiness, health, and well being in my home life or in my personal life. But the skills are, they overlap. They're the same. And if the employer owns wellness and workplace wellness and, and fosters a culture that creates safety, psychological safety and education and support around that, it's going to infinitely impact the employer, but it will empower the employee in all aspects of their life, which you just get a better, a more well-rounded whole human being. Yeah. And especially now with AI and machine learning, yep. a lot of what we're doing, our tasks are going to be taken up. The people side of it is what we still have, you know, so right. kind of nurturing that as well. And the way that we're doing it at Amazon is none of this is forced upon people. You know, we create these tools, yep. we have these resources, we host these sessions and people can come to them if they want. But the interest there, the appetite is there. We've trained like over 300,000 people on these skills in a very short amount of time. And it's like the calendar is completely booked because people see these changes. And something that you can, yeah. I would recommend to employers or managers that something simple that you can implement is just adding gratitude. I, gratitude is such a buzzword, but adding appreciations to. Appreciation is my, yeah, that's where I go to because gratitude is transactional. Appreciation yeah. is, is actually a value add. It raises, it appreciates the value of something. So yeah, you just made a distinction that I usually call to action, but gratitude's the gateway for that. It is, it is, but just like more practically, and these are sort of the tools that we're arming managers with now is how yeah. do you create that culture, especially in a remote environment is really challenging. Yes. So we're really creating tools that are fostering a stronger, healthier, positive workplace. That's incredible. Well, are there any takeaways or nuggets of wisdom you would like to share with everyone out there, especially, yes, we're navigating the holidays. So I want to throw that in there. But anytime as we close out the year and moving into a new year, if you are struggling at work, feeling burnout, can't really, you may not feel right sized or harnessing your passion, what are some things between now and the end of the year that you would recommend people do in? their personal time to start to reevaluate their goals or their direction? What are some practical things that might be helpful so people can step into 2024 more equipped and empowered for a more successful and happy year, professionally and personally? Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere. Whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com motivate or text motivate to 500-500. 
That's audible.com slash motivate or text motivate to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles and Toyota has them. With more on the way, but we also know a BEV is not for everyone. Whether it's because of cost, range, or concerns about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future. In vehicles and manufacturing plants, too, in the years ahead. The materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified, diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Jim Gaffigan here with some more Straight Talk. Now you can get a Walmart Plus membership, plus not pay for it, because it's included with Straight Talk wireless plans. You get free delivery with Walmart Plus, plus a Paramount Plus subscription included. Plus, you pay less for gas. That's a lot of pluses. Only Straight Talk gives you unlimited 5G data and Walmart Plus included on select plans for free. Straight Talk Wireless, available at Walmart. Requires service on gold or platinum unlimited. One offer per eligible account. Paramount Plus essential plan only. Separate registration required. Additional terms apply. What are some practical things that might be helpful so people can step into 2024 more equipped and empowered for a more successful and happy year? When it comes to like feelings of burnout, I think understanding, taking inventory of why that's happening and when it's happening, are you... And managing your energy versus managing your time, because you only have so much energy in a day to dedicate towards something. And then if you're pushing yourself more, you're going to be making mistakes and you're going to burn yourself out. So realizing one, just taking inventory of if you're feeling down, what is it? Is it at work or is this, you know, outside of work and maybe you're not taking care of yourself and that's bleeding into your work, you know, like kind of understanding what is it that's making you feel burnt out and then taking action to address that. So if it's you, you have way too many meetings, this is something that I ran into. It was just like meeting, meeting, meeting back to back to back. Okay. Well, that's not going to work for me in the long term. Yeah. Sustainable. So what meetings are essential? Can a meeting turn into a walking meeting where you're walking with your coworker ch- chatting? So you're like actually getting outside and out of your computer, like ch- kind of reinventing your day a little bit and not just feeling like you have to stay on the, wh- the hamster wheel the whole time. Yes. And setting boundaries yeah. is really important. Like I block off my calendar after five. I don't take calls after five and I have team members all over the globe. So I'll block off time on my calendar when I'm not going to be taking calls and feel empowered to do that. Like take your schedule into your own hands uh, is a big thing. I think a lot of times we feel pressured or at least I did to just go, go, go and take every meeting. But it's like, what is the priority? Do I need to be in this meeting and not just accepting everything that comes into your inbox? Because you could work yourself into the ground and you would still not be done. Yeah. Oh. No, I think that's I think that's so healthy. I mean, managing your energy versus your time, that is a great distinction and clarification to make because they are not necessarily equal. And most of us are hardwired to treat them equally. I should have abundant energy for all the time there is. You know, we off how many of us say, gosh, if there were only 30 hours in a day, you know, and that's a really sad way to think and communicate, but, but that's a good point. Managing your energy versus your time, setting very clear boundaries for yourself, whether it be with your attendance in meetings, your availability, uh, the projects you're working on, really 
really assessing your schedule, your responsibilities, and setting healthy boundaries so you don't feel overextended and you're communicating authentically. But taking your schedule into your own hands, just stating it that way, is like, oh, I know one of the things that I appreciate for myself is in in making my schedule. Of course, things are dictated in terms of clients and appointments, and then I'm able to add things in, but I also add into my schedule on a daily basis, self-care. And I have done that. I mean, I've done it for over a decade. And it's interesting how the self-care contributes to my efficacy, my happiness. And I know when the self-care is kind of inched out or squeezed out, if that happens two or three days in a row, I see it mentally. I see it in my physical body. I see it in my creativity because I have enough time and data to track that. So it's like healthy sleep practices. I, I've gotten healthy sleep for years. And I know when I have things on my plate that preclude consistent healthy sleep, I see it when I can only sleep X amount of hours per night because I've got stuff going on or or life happens. Sometimes things just happen. I feel it and I can feel it in my body where I am not clear and I'm not functional. And so those things, I, yes, become more grateful for my self-care, but there's this appreciation that happens with self-care where I see myself more clear, productive, valuable kinder, (laughs) you know, better communication skills, whatever it may be, and more resilient. When my body is run down or I do get sick, it may run through me a little bit faster because I've created this precedent of care in all aspects of my life. Yeah, absolutely. When I was really struggling career-wise, what I learned so much was that it was more related to me and my relationship to myself and self-care and like things that I were ignoring were more me, but then that bled into my work and like the work yes. I'm using us is kind of the scapegoat, but it really yes. had to like heal <laughs> my trauma and get better healthy habits and something, if you struggle, if anyone listening struggles with habit forming and keeping habits or like keeping resolutions, Run, Don't Walk, Atomic Habits is a book by yeah. James Clear. I think it's a New York Times bestselling book. Yeah, it's a, a great book. A lot of people have read it. If you haven't, I would check that out. Something he suggests in that book is called a habit assessment. And this really helped me is just sit down with a notebook and write down your habits from the time that you wake up in the morning. So wake up, check my phone put chapstick on, go to the bathroom, take a shower, like that granularly go through your day and see how you're actually spending your time. And then when you look at that list for each task that you put, say, is this helping me towards my goals or is this hurting me towards my goals? And sometimes watching Real Housewives is helping you because you want to turn yes. your brain off. I tell you what, I thank you for saying that because I, a lot of times will talk to people about their self-care or spiritual practices being really superficial or mundane. And when you carve out the time, for that and it makes you laugh it brings you joy we all have a myriad of things that can be self-care for us it's just not it's not falling into escapism or complete debilitation around those things so i love that you're defining that too in more broad terms because self-care is personal but you're also asking everyone to make an honest assessment okay i i I hop on my phone immediately first thing in the morning and studies have shown i mean I know, I know this. We talk. I talk about this quite a bit. My first thing in my day is when I am in that groggy state, that's when I pray. I set intentions. I harness that positive energy momentum that is between the sleeping and the waking state. So I hesitate, hesitate before I pick up my phone as long as I can to stay in that state. And it actually builds. It builds on my intentions. I condition my day. But I wouldn't know that if I didn't get really honest about, ooh, I'm just reaching for my phone and scrolling through 
through my email first thing in the morning. So making an honest assessment or appraisal of your time, of your habits, is a great starting place. Yeah. And with no judgment, objectively, just being like, whoa, I didn't realize I was spending, I did this seven times a day. Exactly. Hmm, Is that contributing to my goals or is it keeping me in a stasis? Yeah. Yeah. And just something that has helped me is I don't pick up my phone unless I have a reason to. Like just to pick it up. So good. Think about so good. Where am I going to go? Yeah. Let me just go through my six apps that I go and bounce between yeah. them aimlessly. I don't do that. If I yeah. need direction somewhere, I'll pull up my phone or, you know, I, our phone, our lives are centered around our phones. Like we're going to be on our yeah. phones. That's just how it is now. But I am very intentional about how I use my phone. When I was really going through a hard time, getting off of social media really helped me a lot. I was the type yeah. who would, you know, compare to others or feel behind and like I would feel yeah. worse. So it's like habit assessment, but then also figuring out how are these things making me feel? Is this yes. helping me? Is scrolling on social media for a half an hour helping me? Maybe it is. Maybe, yes, it's great. I love seeing pictures of my family and my friends and sending memes. And this is a great time for me. But there's the other side of that. Or yes. when you're on social media, are you feeling, you know, less than ugly behind, like uh, whatever it is, what are you doing? And then how are these things making you feel? And if it's not yeah. making you feel good and it's not an essential part of life, you know, like bills, paying bills doesn't feel good, but we have to do it. But, you know, like right. generally speaking, how are things making me feel and focus on things that make you feel good. This is a big thing. Like it comes down to your habits and your mindset. Those are the biggest things yeah. that I have really learned. And when it comes to mindset, and I know we've chatted about this, but starting and ending your day with gratitude, there's a lot of research around this. So when you wake up in the morning, asking yourself or telling yourself, setting intentions, like today it is going to be a great day. And then what I like to do at night is ask yourself, what went well today? I learned that from Dr. Daniel Amen, who is yeah. an author and yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. I mean, I follow him on social media and yeah. I learn something all the time. I have so many videos saved from him, especially how he really talks about how bad Diet Coke is because yeah. I don't drink much Diet Coke, but anybody who knows me knows, okay, I like, I just want a fountain Diet Coke. And he's like, carcinogens. So I go back to his videos and be like, okay, I'll have a nice tea. I'll have a nice tea. Okay. Go back to, sorry. I just, I love him, but anyway, go ahead. The best. Yeah. He has this yeah. um, phrase and I hope I get it right. He's like, if you want to feel good, you have to think good because your thoughts create your feelings. Feelings, your feelings create your behaviors, your behaviors create your outcomes. Yeah. So if you are stuck in, which I was, in negative thought patterns and going, thinking the worst and just worrying, future tripping, all of that, a great thing to do is just stop, notice how you're feeling and then choose a different thought. You know, what, what feels better? Like, what can I be grateful for in this situation? What is this teaching me? Just really reframing the negativity in your life. Cause it's going to be there either way, but you do get to yeah. choose how you look at it and the lens that you're seeing it through. Absolutely. That goes to that control thing of what do you have control over your attitude, your yeah. outlook and your actions and and that's the habits and the mindset are the best bang for your buck to see results mm -hmm. to make a difference and an impact and it just it it takes habitual <laughs> action. Yeah. So habitually reviewing your mindset and then choosing to expand it, to shift your perspective, to get curious. And, and I think those things we can all incorporate. We just get to make the decision if we're dedicated to it. And I think for me and for many people, once I see people make a decision, I want to be healthier. I want to be happier. I want to heal this. I want to find more of this it's making that decision and then saying, I'm going after it. It may not be easy, but I'm going to go after it and I'm going to go after it tomorrow and the next day. And before you know it, yeah. all of a sudden there are results or you feel a difference or something clicks or there's an outcome that you didn't expect, but is a result of some consistent effort. 
Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And your failures often lead you to better things. And when doors yeah. close, I think it happens for a reason. Yes. I really think everything happens for a reason. And so it's, it's just knowing that happiness is not an automatic state. I remember Michelle Obama had a quote, she was doing an interview and she was saying that it's your job and your responsibility to do the work, to make yourself feel yes. good. Like it's on you. You have happiness is not something that you earn. Like a lot of times, like, Oh, if I get the job, if I get the relationship, yeah. if I get the house, then I'm going to feel this, but it's short-lived, you have to find happiness, fulfillment in yourself and purpose too. And that goes along yeah. with your career too. I know we're talking yeah. about career focus, but it's about finding that in yourself. Absolutely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for this vast discussion around wellness and how personal wellness, professional wellness, they really are two sides of the same coin, that it is all interconnected and it relates and one does impact the other. So wherever you are looking to establish better wellness and well-being practices, whether it be physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or energetically, or all of the above, I think probably the greatest takeaway is habits and mindset. What Sarah was closing on is looking at and assessing your habits today and doing it objectively. It's not about judgment or shame or berating yourself, being able to take an honest appraisal and then asking yourself, is this adding value? Is this adding or contributing to my goals, my hopes, wishes, desires, and dreams? And in order to do that, getting clear on your your goals, hopes, wishes, desires, and dreams, that's what, that's what usually comes through there. So it gives you a little bit of a template to start affecting some change now into the end of the year that doesn't have to have such external results, but where you internally will start feeling like you're taking action, uh, especially as we move into a new year next year, 2024, which is a highly empowering year. And um, it's one of those years energetically, I'll just close in saying this, where you will reap what you have sown. Meaning if you have done the work and you have wholeheartedly been working and growing to heal, you will feel that. But wherever maybe you've been lacking in that, you will also see the squirreliness, the disease, the discomfort come out erratically. And we will all we all have different levels and spectrums of this. So nobody's just going to come out perfectly and then others are going to come out at a detriment. It's not it's not making those broad stroke claims, but it is saying you will see where your deficits are in areas that maybe you have denied strengthening new muscles or doing the healing work or the growth. And then you will see your successes where you have created that traction. So I think this leads up into the end of the year and into next year beautifully in a multitude of ways. So thank you. Yeah. And I would just close by saying the last piece I think of advice that I would give is just to be kind to yourself and give yourself permission to be a beginner. I hear a lot of imposter syndrome and people feeling like a phony. It doesn't matter what level you're at. People feel that way. And something that I hear a lot is, you know, fake it till you make it. And I used to love that phrase, but I don't, Ooh, I don't like that it. anymore <laughs> because you're not no. faking it. You're doing it for the first time. Yeah. So it's yes, you know, be confident and like trick your brain into telling yourself you're excited instead of being nervous. Like there's things that you can do, but I would just say giving yourself grace is really important, especially around the holidays. If you're not able to get to everything on your to-do list or you're, you burn the pie, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you burn. That's a good example. If you burn the pie, it's okay. Like it, it yeah. is okay. Yeah. Exactly. The Hopefully the in, like just the crust and the inside is good. Right, so, exactly. I'm like, if there's a pie in front of me, I'll probably eat it, even if it's burned on the bottom. <laughs> like I'll find, I'll find the good stuff in it. So it's all that. It's the mindset, you know. Okay, the crust may be burned, but the middle isn't. Yeah. So like, give me that part of it. You know, that's the way I go at it. So, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insight and your experience on your personal journey and how that is impacting you in the workforce and your role today and your evolving role, especially in wellness and emotional intelligence. I think it's very needed and I'm, I'm excited for your voice to come through even broader and in more of a leadership 
role in that area. It's much needed. So thank you for coming on. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you've gotten some practical wisdom, valuable nuggets from this, and you can do some shifting in your habits, really have the courage to assess your habits and look at your mindset and how it's contributing. And then also permission to be a beginner, like Sarah said, giving yourself the grace and the kindness to say, okay, I'm shifting my habits. That's it's not an easy thing. Okay, I'm just getting started at this instead of having those high expectations that many of us do. So we do give ourselves the space and the grace because the advancement will come as a result of that. Thank you for joining me on Soul Sessions. Have an amazing week. Be well. No one likes to talk about money. Am I saving enough? Can I buy a house? Am I paying too much in taxes? Will I be able to retire? What if you could unlock insights about your finances in less than five minutes with a clear picture of where you stand today and where your money can work harder? Now you can. Visit facet.com to take the free quiz and get your financial wellness score today. That's F-A-C-E-T.com. This ad is sponsored by Facet. Facet Wealth Incorporated is an SEC registered investment advisor. This is not an offer to buy or sell securities, nor is it investment, legal, or tax advice. Make it a clean sweep this Black Friday with incredible deals on state-of-the-art Roborock vacuums. Get the all-in-one Q Revo for just $679.99. Or the S7 Max Ultra with Roborock's best features for $949.99. And the S8 Pro Ultra has it all for $1199.99. But these deals won't gather dust. They're only available November 20th through 30th at Roborock.com and Amazon.com. Meet the Chevy ZR2 family of off-road trucks. They will never let you down with features like Multimatic DSSV dampers, Goodyear Territory MT tires, underbody aluminum skid plates, and an off-road performance display. When the going gets tough, it is a family you can count on. Introducing the Silverado Colorado and Silverado HD ZR2 family of trucks. Head over to Chevy.com to learn more.